I also want to apologize if I sound a little bit hoarse. Um, as many of you may or may not know, the Saints won the Super Bowl. <laughs> and I committed most of my vocal cords to the Houdat Nation, which is pretty rad. So by a show of hands, who saw the Super Bowl? Oh. <laughs> Well, um, it was the most watched television show in the history of American television. It surpassed the MASH finale, um, <laughs> which is pretty awesome. And uh, the New Orleans Saints made history by winning for the first time ever. And it was amazing. It was really amazing and really special. And. Um, some people were comparing it to the Emancipation Proclamation in the U.S., so that's how emotional it was. It's pretty cool. And the, the saints are um, black and gold, and the fans are always grammatically incorrect and fanatical. We are. Um, and our battle cry is, who dat? And, you know, um, it came clear tonight when Jocelyn came up to me and he said, what's that? <laughs> when he was asking me about my flowers, my black and gold flowers, and I had to explain where they came from. And I was like, oh, that's where Houdat comes from. You know, it's this French influence in <laughs> New Orleans. So when um, we have to practice this to start the lecture. So the way it works is, like, I say Houdat, and you guys say Houdat. That's how the that's how the battle cry goes. So we'll just try. It. So who dat? <laughs> that was great. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. So because I'm not from here, and I've actually this is my first time in Montreal, and it's so beautiful. It's a really cool city. It's actually a really cold city, but it's really cool. Um, and just in the day that I've been here, I've already you know experienced a lot of architectural personality and beauty, and that's really nice to be part of, um, and it kind of helps me forget the cold, because I'm completely allergic to cold. And um, so I thought I would start off the lecture with a little bit of background, sort of the who, what, and why I do what I do, and then sort of delve into Herman's house and the actual what. And so I, um, that's me, and I grew up on Long Island in New York. Has anyone ever been to Long Island? Raise your hand. Sorry. <laughs> it's like culturally duplicit, <laughs> awful place um, in most ways. But um, And they still have this hairdo, like the majority of people on Long Island <laughs> actually still have this hairdo, my aunts and stuff. But I played football and um, tackle football as a kid, 13. And um, I was the only girl on the all-boys league. And so Robert King, who I'll talk about in a little while, thinks that was my first act of activism. That was the first thing I did as an activist. But I really just love the game. And my mom um, begged me to take these ridiculous photos. And then every time I have a lecture, I'm really excited um, <laughs> that I have them. Because they make me look extra cool, especially this one. <laughs> So um, I think that's really important. And also, um, I just want to talk about, I've had many different lives, and Michelle and I talked about this a little bit today. I studied sports medicine originally. I grew up on Long Island, as I said. I played Division I soccer. I wore so many different hats um, at different times in my life, and I just kind of found my way into making art and then using art as a catalyst for activism um, or a social generator in a lot of ways. And one of the other hats I wore is, I was an actress for a little while, and, um, here, this is cool. Oh, <laughs> Did I wow you? Yeah. <laughs> If that didn't wow you, maybe this will. So this is another part of my life. 
This is me with all of my Canadian celebrity fans. That's, what do you think? That was a little embarrassing. And then, uh, I know he's not Canadian, but he's kind of an international hunk. Brad Pitt. And he's really cool. Yeah. Um, no, but I'm going to stop with the Photoshop and talk a little bit about the why I do what I do. And in case you didn't know, that was fake. <laughs> uh, this is a photo I took in Rome in uh, 2004, actually, when I was backpacking around. And this is an American tourist who was wearing a shirt that really summarized the reason I do what I do. Um, her shirt... Um, if you can't read it because it's a little bit blurry, it says Compact Warriors, the killer PCs, right? So she's wearing a shirt um, where there's no distance between an imperial death machine and a personal computer. And for me, that's a big problem. And I think it's a symptom of what I consider this conflation of emotional principles. Right? this inability to separate them, and this idea that we are desensitized because we're constantly fed images, and we're constantly fed images by corporate media, you know, or images of sadness all the time, you know? Like, all of the stuff that's wrong with the world is always pounding us to the point where we can't even decipher the difference between an imperial machine and a... Uh, personal computer, you know? And when that happens, we, we lose a lot. We lose a lot of our ability to negotiate the world, and stuff like this happens, right? Which is pretty ironic. And stuff like this, you know? And stuff like this. And this is an article I found shortly after the massacre in Fallujah. Um, by the American army, where they began by sound blasting the people of Fallujah, did you hear about this? With ACDC's Shoot to Thrill. And, um, and this website is slightly objective as it talks about it, but then you could click on a link and buy the song, you know? <laughs> so it's part of this, as I said, bombardment of tragedy, you know? And for me, I think of it as a, like a slur of sadness or like a river of sadness. And when it's always coming at us, it's really hard to just take a moment to take a break, you know, and decipher the difference between our own emotions. And I think it's, you know, because we are desensitized as, as, a, as a collective, you know, as a worldwide collective, we make a lot of bad choices and we become immune to awareness and numb to wrongness, and kind of deaf to the immoral, or blind to the unconscionable. And our priorities get all screwed up. And this is somebody who's speaking from living in the belly of the beast, right? I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, in the most violent ward, in the most violent city, in what is arguably the most violent country, you know, depending on how you define violence. And so for me to see all of this Blindness and numbness and deafness is, is unconscionable. I can't sit with it. And that is the motivating force of how I do what I do. And this image is an image of some pretty demented priorities, you know, where it's like it's more important to find advertising space than to fix the buildings in Sarajevo, you know. And I think, you know, it's a tragedy when stuff like this happens. These are friends of mine who were protesting outside the port in Oakland, California, and they got shot up by rubber bullets because <laughs> they were protesting the war by the police. And Twitter didn't tell anybody what to do, so nobody did anything, which is tragic. And this is an image that I took outside Lockheed Martin, which is one of the biggest profiteers of the war. And there was a bunch of us nonviolent vegetarians protesting outside Lockheed Martin. And the next thing you know, these police and military police showed up, basically two to one, 
to the protesters. And in the States, there's actually supposed to be a separation. The police aren't supposed to be participating with the military. In fact, the police, the motto of the police is to serve and protect corporate interests is what's parenthetically missing. And so what happens is we get fed images like this on the same proverbial dinner plate as uh, desperate housewives, you know, and we can't separate it. And this is an image I took just after Katrina. I went down there to New Orleans and um, started a grassroots organization, a relief organization called Common Ground. And like I said, we'll talk about that a little more. And then images like this. This is also in the Lower Ninth Ward, eight months after it was flooded. Doesn't look that different. And this, which is Sunday. <laughs> this Sunday. You know, so things haven't changed that much. And that's a tragedy in the richest country of the world, right? So we'll play a little game, a little interruption here. Um, by a show of hands again, who knows who this is? That's not so many. Who is it? Josh Hartman. Nope. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> That's cool, actually. Usually it's the whole audience. Try again. Ashton Kutcher. Who's he married to? There you go. Do you know their age difference? I don't know. I was just asking. Okay, show of hands. Who knows who this is? Or, yeah. Yeah, that's one hand. This is, uh, this, this is Subcomandante Marcos and Comandante Ramona of the Zapatistas who are engaging in, a, in guerrilla warfare, right, today started in 1994, and Subcomandante Sub Marcos is also known as Delicate Zero, right? So they've been waging this campaign which some, peop uh, some scholars call a postmodern revolution under the slogan, for everyone, everything, for us, nothing. And I think it's an important conversation when we talk about social revolutions that we can make references to the Black Panther Party, for instance, or to Che Guevara, or these iconic uh, revolutionary movements. But then there's one happening right now today in Chiapas, Mexico, which really isn't that far away. I mean, there's a big country in the way for you guys, but for us, it's not that far away. And we don't know who they are. And that's a problem. But more than I don't know, 10 times as many people in this room knew who Ashton Kutcher was. Well, so you didn't accept you. I don't, I don't even know who that guy was that you said Josh Hartnett. <laughs> but, uh, Girl. Okay. And um, I think there's a solution to that. Like, I don't think it's a matter of not knowing Ashton Kutcher and knowing only who the Zapatistas are, but there is a solution, and that solution requires a lot of effort and creativity. Which brings me to the what, the what I do. And I think about myself as, as an interrupter, you know? And I think interrupting that sort of sad or the cadence with which we've, we are fed images and news and everything that is so disappointing, being able to interrupt that is really important. To give ourselves space and distance to actually connect to our emotions and to make righteous decisions. And so that's how I review my responsibility, not only as an artist, but as a citizen, you know, and as someone who has the privilege of awareness. Because believe you me, awareness is privilege. You know, in the same way, healthcare is privilege, education is privilege, you know, awareness is privilege. And so I take it very seriously, and, and that's what I do. I interrupt things. And, Michelle and I were just talking about Germany. This is a mural in New Orleans, by the way, which I thought was very brave. It's a MLK reference. But um, Michelle and I were talking about Germany, and I was in Stuttgart, Germany, for a little while. Um, shortly after, directly after, I was in Katrina under martial law um, in New Orleans. I flew to Germany to be part of this 
uh, residency in a Baroque castle in the middle of Baden-Württemberg. So it was this incredible juxtaposition for me. And I got sick for like three months. And when I came out of the sickness, it was the spring, and people were getting married a lot and spending, you know, tens of thousands of euros, which is like a million dollars, on um, their weddings. <laughs> and I just had this experience of being in this beautiful city that was raised and forgotten of New Orleans. And so it was really frustrating. And, um, and I had to deal with that. And so this is an example of interrupting. These are people in Baden-Württemberg taking their wedding pictures. <laughs> so I made a giant sausage and would drag it through their wedding photos. So the interruptions don't always have to be aggressive, right? Like laughter is a sign of triumph for sure. You know, my experience with Herman Wallace is to laugh is liberty, you know in the truest sense. And I think living in New Orleans, despite everything that it's gone through over the last 400 years, you know, all of the tragedies up until like literally winning the Super Bowl, <laughs> there's still so much laughter and joy there. And there's so many interruptions and so many triumphs. And, and that's one of the reasons, despite, you know, other people or other artists saying to me, that's like, that's artist career suicide, living in New Orleans. It's so beautiful, and it's so inspiring, and it's kind of like when you see other people doing it, you have the confidence to do it yourself, or to keep doing it, or whatever, to be fearless with your own identity and fearless with your interruptions. And so New Orleans, like I said, is really good at that. Did you want to sit down? You're not gonna, you can walk across, it's cool. Thank you. You're welcome. That was an interruption. <laughs> See, I think New Orleans has a lot of flavor and style, and they tend to interrupt this like panorama of convention, and I'll just go through a few sites. Interrupt, blight, I love that. Like someone was like, I don't mind having windows and a door, so I'm just gonna make it happen because no one else is gonna help me. Huh. And this was done in the, in the eighth ward, right next to where I live. Someone just put that up. And this, I think, is, ooh, I went the wrong way. Interrupting sadness. So these are all of her friends that were murdered that year. It's pretty brave, huh? Interrupting borders or real estate. So cool, I love that city. And this is interrupting violence. This is an Episcopal, relatively conservative church on uh, Esplanade. St. Anna's, and they decided that they were going to make public the names of every single person who's been violently murdered in New Orleans last year. There was 943 people, 2009, killed by guns or knives. So instead of just ignoring it or getting used to it, they put it in your face, and it's on the front of the church. You have to think about it, right? And not only that, you have to think about how they were killed, so they actually say stab, wound, shooting, whatever, right? It's like, you can't forget. New Orleans is really good at interrupting this history of racism. This is a second line. Has anyone ever been to a second line or know what a second line is? Okay, we'll talk about that at the end. But it's really this cathartic expression of joy, predominantly in the black communities. And this is one of the oldest ones. This is tambourine and fan. And it's organized by Jerome Smith, who's an old civil rights leader and one of the original freedom writers. And so every year, he organizes these young people from the 7th and 8th wards, the two roughest neighborhoods in New Orleans, to participate in a giant second line, which is so beautiful. And you've never seen kids dance like kids in New Orleans. It's humbling. It's so gorgeous. But it's not only joy. And last year, Jerome uh, screen printed images of the original Freedom Riders on all the kids' backs, which I thought was pretty beautiful. This is a barber shop in New Orleans where they're still talking about Mark Essex, which is also pretty brave. He was a black revolutionary who was killed in 1973 in New Orleans. And interrupt 
400 years of being ignored by municipalities, you know? If you're not gonna give us garbage cans, we're gonna make our own. That's what's up. This next slide, I don't know, Michelle, if you wanna cover your daughter's eyes. It's a little gross. But uh, I, didn't, I didn't take this picture, but I was really proud of the person who did this, because I thought it was funny, right? It's an interruption. And I think it's really important to celebrate interruptions, right? It's so important because it gives us the confidence to keep doing it. So celebrating interruptions and interceptions. <laughs> who dat? You guys, who dat? <laughs> That's Tracy Porter from uh, Port Allen, Louisiana who was the cornerback for the New Orleans Saints that sunk the victory with this interception running 74 yards for a touchdown. <laughs> who dat? It was awesome. Yeah. So this is why I was invited to speak here to talk about Herman Wallace and my project, The House That Herman Built, and how it works as an interrupter. So who is Herman Wallace? That's Herman Wallace. And he's 68 and a half years old. Out of those 68 and a half years, he spent 38 and a half years in a six foot by nine foot cell, a minimum of 23 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, in, uh, in a cell in the middle of Louisiana, which is part of the United States, which claims to be the leader of the free world, right? And um, Herman spent 37 of those years in solitary in Angola prison, which is the largest prison in America. It's a former slave plantation named for the place in Africa where they thought the most profitable slaves came from. It's 18,000 acres, small, <laughs> it's huge. And um, there's about 5,125 prisoners in Angola right now, male prisoners. 80% of them are black. 100% of the administration is white. Every physically able prisoner is forced to work a minimum of 40 hours a week for two to 20 cents an hour on the fields in Angola. So those paradigms of slavery haven't changed that much, right? So they say former slave plantation, but it's arguable. And Herman Wallace is a Black Panther and he identifies as a political prisoner um, he's part of what's collectively known as the Angola Three, and he is the reason that I'm in New Orleans. Is he, that's where he's from, and where his family still lives, and where he would like to build his dream home. And I met Herman Wallace through this man. This is Robert King. Robert King spent 29 years in solitary confinement, same conditions as Herman, 31 years in Angola for a crime he didn't commit, and he was released on February 8, 2001. And he came to San Francisco shortly after um, being released. It was after uh, years and years of legal battles. Um, he received no compensation for wrongful imprisonment from the state of Louisiana. And he came to Louisiana, uh, sorry, he came to San Francisco where I was living at the time and spoke about his experience of being incarcerated in solitary confinement in Louisiana. And he spoke about the history of the Black Panther Party and he spoke about Herman and Albert predominantly. And Herman and Albert are the two of the Angola Three who are still in solitary confinement. And just briefly, they've been convicted of killing a prison guard. Originally, Herman, Albert, and Robert were all incarcerated for separate armed robberies. And while in prison, in the bloodiest prison in America, Angola, which was also segregated until 1974, they organized the first chapter of the Black Panther Party for self-defense. And in doing so, they were very um, successful in educating prisoners, teaching prisoners how to read, um, assuaging race relations in the most bloody prison in America, and most predominantly what they did is they ended this rape trade, which was very lucrative for the prison. So basically in the 1970s in Angola, Prisoners who were serving life sentences without possibility of parole and had good behavior for 10 years or more became what was known as a khaki back. And a khaki back was a prisoner guard. So even though you were a convicted felon, you were still given a rifle and asked to chase after prisoners who tried to escape and performed all the duties of a guard. And what happened as a result of this 
um, corrupt system was new prisoners would come in to Angola and they would be um, uh, sold to older prisoners as part of this rape trade. And obviously it was very violent and the Black Panthers, it was one of the first things that they put it into. They organized the prison against it and through nonviolent uh, means inside the prison, hunger strikes, etc., etc., and also by writing litigation to the state of Louisiana. And in 1971, the entire prison system had to be changed, and there were no longer khaki backs, et cetera, et cetera. It was through this woman who was uh, in charge of the Department of Corrections, the DOC, DOC Elaine Hunt, um, and through their actual written legislation, which is kind of amazing. And so King came out in early 2001, and, and he spoke about this, and he spoke about all of this violence against him, and what it was like to serve 29 years in solitary confinement for a crime he didn't commit, and he was really calm, <laughs> and he wasn't mad, and he was really gentle. And I thought, wow, I want to be like that. That's cool, because if you cut me off while I'm driving, I'll probably say a lot of really bad words, you know? I'm not like that. I don't want to be like that. And at the end of his talk, when we all listened to what he had to say, um, he said, does anyone have any questions? And nobody raised their hand. We were all just like silenced by that reality. I had never even, I just thought bad people went to prison, you know? And, uh, and, and I just kind of nervously raised my hand. And I was like, well, what, what, what do we do? And he said, write my comrades. And that was the beginning of my relationship with Herman Wallace and Albert Wood Fox. I wrote my first Prisoners. And um, this is Robert King this Christmas with my dad. He's kicking my dad's butt in chess. <laughs> and off to the side is my brother saying things like, Daddy, don't fail me. <laughs> and so one of the things that's really re remarkable and inspiring about King is his commitments to laughter and joy, despite his history. And King lived in this cell. This is a letter from Herman. So King lived in this cell for most of his 29 years. This is a solitary confinement, or CCR cell, in Angola prison. It's 6 foot by 9 foot by 12 foot. The height is 12. So when you go inside one of these cells, it's really disorienting because you want to really push it down because you have so much space that you can't use above you, and no space for your own existence. So if you can try to imagine living, living in this for um, 29 years, or 38 years, or whatever it is, it's near impossible. I can't even sit in the bathroom for like more than 20 minutes, you know? And it's about the same size. And so when I first began to write Herman and Albert, it was very casual, and shortly after, um, Herman Wallace got thrown into something called the dungeon. And the dungeon is a little more punitive than solitary confinement. It's a cell within a cell, 24-hour surveillance, no natural light, revoked phone privileges, and revoked visiting privileges. And so through our uh, initial letter uh, writing exchange, I started to see his condition dilapidate. His handwriting started to dilapidate. He was not able to keep a thought. And I started to see him die a little faster than Wood Fox, for instance. And it was from that experience of seeing him do this. And all the time, just for the record, I was on a full ride with scholarship to study art at Stanford University, right? So again, there's this crazy juxtaposition of privilege his reality. And it was really hard. I mean, for me, I was going to quit. I was like, this is stupid. What's going on? How can, how can I exist in a world that allows this to happen, you know, where I get paid to make art at Stanford, and he's in a six foot by nine foot cell on his 30th year. And that frustration is where the project began. And so in 2003, as a bit of a game between Herman and myself, I asked him, what kind of house do you dream of after spending 30 years in prison? And it was part of a conversation of actually a class that I was taking in at Stanford. Um, and, and it was meant just to be a game between Herman and I as a way for, um, for us to play. And I always say, like, for me, the muscle I hustle the most is pretend, right? 
my tool is the imagination. I'm an artist, right? Maybe other people are like a banker or lawyers or whatever. And so there's other ways to use your tools, you know, to affect change. For me, it's the imagination. And so that's what I did. And Herman wrote back and he was like, what kind of house do I dream of? I don't dream about a house. I'm a revolutionary. I'm going to be on the battlefields of Mexico. And I was like, but you're 60. <laughs> And he was like, okay, I'll start dreaming about a house. And so <laughs> this is the first house. And it's very sweet. And um, sorry, my throat keeps drying up. But he traced it from a photograph um, of somebody's house, childhood house, that was a supporter, a long-term supporter of the Angola Three. And I thought that was really endearing. And I thought it was a good place to start. So we began with this house. And then I really started to push him to think about it. and and. While I was at Stanford, I had access to their like, super posh architectural library, so I started photographing images of like contemporary modern houses and sending them to him, and he was like, what the F is that? <laughs> what happened while I was in prison? People are living in tree houses. <laughs> you know, it's like really confounding. And so a lot of his designs are really simple references. You know, in a way, he's been kept in a time capsule. And so... Um, these are just images or scans of letters that, from the beginning of our exchange, you know. And I started visiting them um, in 2003, the same time we started this project. So a lot of this project transpires through a written correspondence and our phone calls, and most importantly, visits to the prison, because the prison edits your mail. Surprise, surprise. And by doing so, not all of his uh, dreams are able to be articulated, and vice versa. You know, he couldn't receive everything. So those visits were critical and really hard because I was living in San Francisco, which is another reason why it makes sense for me to be in New Orleans. And what was so rewarding about this exchange is that, you know, I realized that I could talk about Herman's situation and I could talk about the situation of the Angola Three, and it just became part of that slur of sadness, right? It just became another blip on the map of things that's wrong with the world. But once it was infused with a bit of hope or a bit of the imagination, people started to listen. And it was part of that interruption that I was talking about. So it was like, I would start talking about his shag carpeting or his mirrored ceilings or, you know, his bear skin on the bed or whatever, you know? And people started to listen. Oh, wait, who? Herman, he's been in six foot by nine foot cell. And it started to stick a little bit more than every other depressing fact that we're fed. And so Herman and I began to realize this is a great organizing tool. And that's when we began to really push the project and think of it as an art project and as a Trojan horse to talk about these issues. And at the same time, I realized that he was actually escaping Angola at the same time. And that, for me, was the greatest reward and my biggest motivating force, because it's hard, you know? and. Um, Right now, there's no surprise, I guess, but uh, right now we are fundraising to build the, his dream home in New Orleans, in the city where he grew up. And that's, that's really hard. <laughs> there's a lot of forces against us, including logic, you know? Um, never mind all these people who are buried in this conservative state of Louisiana and all the ghosts that have fought against the Black Panther Party and are part of this collective psyche of COINTELPRO and, and who just quite frankly don't like black people, you know? So there's a lot of this stuff that we're fighting. And the motivating force is the fact that if Herman Wallace, who's serving a life sentence without the possibility of parole, despite being innocent, never physically gets out of prison, I know he's been outside of Angola. And that's pretty special. And so we had this written exchange of drawings and letters, and those drawings and letters started to become more developed. And then I started, I made my first model. This is in my studio at Stanford, just now. do you remember it? <laughs> and those models developed into more detailed models. Yeah, it's cool, huh? And then I made a CAD drawing. And those CAD drawings developed even further. And what's been so nice is part of um, the attraction of the hope and the beauty, implicit beauty of this project is that people have come on board and said, I want to be part of it. And that's really humbling for me. It's not, it's not like something you have to ask. 
ask, you know? It's like, do it, just do it. And so this is an architect out of Chicago who was like, hey, I read about your project in some fancy pants magazine, and I think it's really great, can I help you? And I was like, can you make a CAD drawing? And he was like, sure. And so he committed himself for free. And this is Herman's pool. <laughs> And this is his conference room with his wall of revolutionary fame and all of our American abolitionists and his mahogany organizing table and bulletproof windows. <laughs> and this is his um, rooftop garden, which garden is a big part of his life. It's really special. And I'm going to show some images of the exhibitions because there's been many various forms and there's many ways to talk about Herman's house and Herman's dream and ultimately Herman's situation. And I was saying earlier to Marina, this is, it's unusual for me to have a lecture having not shown in the same city or space or whatever. Um, so these are images from Artist Space in New York and generally what I like to do is um, create some sort of representation of his reality, in this case I rebuilt his cell, and then juxtapose that to his imagination. So in the back you can see the video CAD, and now we have working blueprints that were also designed by an architect, so like, we're ready to go. Like This house can be built tomorrow if someone in this room says, hey Jackie, I'd like to give you $500,000. <laughs> by a show of hands, who wants to give me $500,000? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to have it, you could just want to. Um, this, is, this is in Canada, you guys, in Kelowna. It's another um, way I've represented this cell. And this is in London at the RCA. Oh, that was an accidental transition. Uh, but it's a different material. This is Miss Vicky. That's Herman's older sister. She's 70. And her first introduction to the cell uh, after 40 years of visiting Herman in Angola was through this exhibition. This is Prospect One in New Orleans, that big fancy Biennale, blah, blah, blah. But what was really nice was that this was kind of the centerpiece for the Contemporary Art Museum. It was cool. And it was the first time I didn't have to explain what Angola was, because people knew. And for me, one of the most touching things was I walked in, and um, one of the women who were taking tickets at the front, I mean, she, had, she, she was New Orleans born and bred. She had, like, two teeth in her whole mouth, you know, and pretty beat-up-looking woman, but, you know, beautiful in her own sense. And so she was working for Prospect One, and she was so touched by this exhibition that any time someone would come in that she thought, um, was famous or a basketball player or whomever, she would personally escort them through my installation. It was rad. Oh, I keep doing that. It's like arrow dyslexia. And this is um, inside Prospect One. So those that's just a redesign, the inside of the cell, and um, some blueprints. And the cell is all made from Herman's drawings. So it's kind of a reversal of order where I have to enter his space very intimately through his drawings. Sorry, I'm just gonna flash through them. This is made out of um, sheetrock and mud. Don't do that if you're ever gonna rebuild his cell. It takes forever and it's really messy. And this is in Poland. And so this is kind of the budget way that I represented his cell. And I think it's really effective. And I always encourage people who see this if you have space in your house, do it. It's a way to talk about him, you know? It's an interruption, and it's a reminder, you know, that we coexist with this reality, and now we have the awareness, and now we have the responsibility, because it's not okay. And like I said, you know, the, we have working blueprints, you know, and now we've transitioned into a space where we're ready to build his house. Um, which is pretty rad. And this next slide is the pinnacle of my career as an artist. Do you know who that is? Yeah. No one in the States knows who that is. <laughs> but everyone knows who Ashton Kutcher is. She was cool. So um, there's many different tiers to Herman's house, you know, and many different ways to organize. And part of what we do um, 
which maintains the integrity of this idea of interrupting. Is that we've co-opted this kind of uh, consumer language and created materials that are kind of cool, you know, but still talk about the situation. And, um, and that's another way that we can impregnate awareness, you know, into, into a kind of numb culture. So I'll just go through some of these slides. And all of this is like open source. Y'all want to make your shirts or bags or whatever, do it, you know. That's New Orleans in the background. I know it looks like the third world, because it is. That's my godson, Malik. He's my hero. This is nice. This is a guerrilla campaign that someone in London did. I think it's pretty smart. So she would she made those tiles and then just like epoxy them all over. Who is Herman Wallace? There's lots of ways you can do it, you know. <laughs> this is a solidarity interruption. Those are some pretty amazing folks, community organizers in New Orleans. And this is in London. And this is something I'm really proud of. The woman, um, Carrie, who's actually on the right, she contacted me after reading about this project in the New York Times and said, I think it's really special. Do you mind if I do something for the Angola 3? And I said, go for it. And so she turned the whole side of her house in Chiswick, London, into this mural dedicated to the Angola 3. It's like crazy labor-intensive mosaic. It's totally not my aesthetic. But I think it's so badass that she did it. She was just like, forget it, let's do it. And so um, we had an, I had an opening in London, and as part of that opening, we flew Robert King in and also unveiled her, um, her wall and had a big party. It was cool. And this is a table that some students in California made with a painting of Ms. Vicky and Herman, and then they gave it to Ms. Vicky, which was really sweet. And this is an image. Um, which is part of an ongoing campaign of radical walking tours. So if you ever come to New Orleans, you can download these walking tours, and it'll give you a history of Herman as a child, and a history of Albert as a child, um, or growing up in New Orleans and what it was like. And there's these little wheat pasted markers, which is also another creative way to sort of interrupt what's happening or interrupt whatever tours you might take in New Orleans. One thing we realized was that um, it's re they're, they're awesome, and you can download them and take them as walking tours, but in a lot of those neighborhoods, you don't want to be walking around with your iPod. <laughs> so so we got to make them driving tours as well. This is cool. This is um, literally, I went to go visit Herman one day, and I came home, and this was in my yard in New Orleans. And again, it was a bunch of students who had come to visit, and I did a, a lecture for them, and they were really touched. And as a surprise, I came home to this. It's cool, huh? Yeah. And then... <clears throat> I just put this slide in because I actually think my hair looks good there. <laughs> and that's me and Robert King. And um, I'm going to show you uh, another trajectory of Herman's House, which is a documentary film being produced by Angad Bala, who is an independent filmmaker. He, oh, he says, hi, Jocelyn. I meant to tell you. Angad from Stanford. I'll show you a photo. But, um, and now he's out of Toronto, and he's working with a Toronto-based production company, Storyline Productions, to make a documentary film about this project, which for me is cool. Like, I would never really thought it was remarkable. It was just what I was doing. Like I said, now there's all of these, I just kind of like got the soil ready, and now there's all these really cool projects and beautiful plants that are coming out of it. So I can't take any credit and wouldn't for this trailer that I'll show you. It's four minutes, um, but I will apologize for my hair throughout because it's really, really bad. <coughs> Are we okay for sound coming on my computer? Okay, cool. can only make about four steps forward before I touch the door. And if I turn and I'm about face, I'm going to bump into something. I'm in the cell 23 hours a day. 
I'm used to it, and that's one of the bad things about it. We're friends, you know, and I'm sure he's going to want to know about my brother's wedding and how it went. He's really upset he couldn't go, and I'm sure he's going to want to know uh, if I have a boyfriend and why not. I dealt with Jackie when she was in Stanford doing a project and she called upon me to help her, which I would never even dream of a house to live in outside of this kind of country. Being out there in the streets, uh, even if I was homeless, I was satisfied. Do you have any ideas that it would go to to this point? No way, dude. Like, it was just a game between me and Herman. That's what I thought. The designing of the house was basically a mixture of a lot of other things. The type of rooms that I wanted, things that I wanted included within the house, and even around the house for that matter. <laughs> and people say it's a beautiful home. Jackie! Hey, Jackie! Hey, Jackie. And look at us being in the six by nine set up. They're not going to take it for the animals and the trees like that unless they're doing some experiment with the animals in order to kill them. And that's the way that they treat up. There was never, ever solitary confinement. This is not the Les Miserables. There's not a hole in the top of a cell. There are TVs, access, tears. The average person that has done that kind of time that went completely insane. Just a strange two words though, huh? Like real estate. That's the that we're looking at for a virtual home. I'm thinking about creating a place down community where my kids can come and stay away from this drug. And sometimes I create something totally different. Solitary confinement is solitary confinement. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. Some people deserve it and some don't. Whether he's a convicted murderer or not, that house is going to be a good thing. It helps me maintain what little sanity that I have left my humanity and dignity. And I was like, I was crying. <laughs> And then he was like, he was like, why are you crying? And I said, because I'm afraid I'm going to fail you. I'm afraid I won't do it. And then he said, you can't fail me. Whether I live in a house or not, it makes no difference. It is the symbol of what this house is all about. Sometimes I think I don't actually have to do the lecture. I can just show that. The trailer is cool. This is a more recent photo of me and Herman inside Angola prison. His uh, prison name, you know, every prisoner has a nickname, is Hooks, because he has really bow legs. You can see him in, the <laughs> in that picture on the right. Um, so we're at 48 minutes, and um, I want to make sure that there's time to answer questions. So. I also would like to offer to show the CAD video um, of Herman's house, which is a three-dimensional rendering of his house. And um, Robert King is reading his letters, so it gives you a really intimate view of, of his dreams. And if you'd like to watch it, one thing to pay attention to is um, King when he laughs at Herman reading the letters because it really illustrates their camaraderie and brothership, and it's pretty beautiful. Um, if you guys would like to watch it, I just have to switch technology really fast. Is that cool? Okay. Maybe it's easier if we dim the lights a little. I think the lights are on in the audience. Yeah, cool.
afternoon. My name is Robert King Wilkerson. I'm the freed member of the Angola Freed, and I spent 31 years in Angola prison, 29 in solitary confinement. Uh, you don't want to know much about me. I'm free. Uh, I want to speak to you tonight about my comrade, Homo Wallace. Um, Homo Wallace, I say, is a comrade, and uh, he makes up one third of the Angola Creed. Um, Albert Woodfox, uh, he make up the final third, but his is another story. Uh, this is a story about Homer Wallace. Uh, he is now into his 36th year in Angola State Penitentiary uh, down in Louisiana. This is his 32nd year in solitary confinement. This is the house that Herman built. From the letter, Dear Jackie, in your letter you ask me what sort of house does a man who live in a six foot by nine foot cell for 30 years dream of? First, in the front of the house, I have three squares of gardens. The flower gardens are the easiest for me to imagine, and I can see they will be certain to be full of gardenias, carnations, and tulips. This is of the utmost importance. I would like for guests to be able to walk through flowers all year round. Please enter through the two car garage. A garage for two cars is necessary as when the cars are not there, it can be used for space and storage. <laughs> I want to hang hose pipe on the wall, two spare tires on both sides, and the cars could be parked in them. Without the cars, no one would figure it's a garage. From the two car garage, you can walk right into a small hallway which connects to a pantry for dry food storage. In the pantry, there should be foodstuff, cans of non-perishable foods, onions, potatoes, Tabasco, various bottles of wine. The pantry is easily accessible through the garage, so you can unload groceries with ease. From the pantry, you can walk into a hobby shop. In the hobby shops are various tools, machines, workshop tables, and a wooden floor. I enjoy tinkering with small electrical appliances, old typewriters, malfunction radios, and speakers. And if you remember, in prison, I once rigged a radio into a transmitter. From the pantry, we can enter the kitchen. The kitchen is the largest room on the first floor. It is yellow and equipped with wall and base cabinets made of solid pecan wood and an extensive cutter top. There is a double door refrigerator against it. East slash south wall. The floor is made of tile, and there are several microwaves to the right of the stove <laughs> for entertaining guests at parties. The kitchen must also have a family-friendly focus. Press the table with a plate of food by each chair. Add a small basket of hot rolls. Put a skillet under the fire making shrimp and oyster gravy alongside a pot of beans. Make sure to put a sprinkler in the ceiling and make the kitchen safe for cooking. Between the southwest and southeast base cabinets is a door that leads to the dining slash conference room with a polished wooden floor. The conference room is a bum. We have a 16-chair mahogany conference table with three large windows overlooking the front entrance to our beautiful garden. If you will notice, on the first side of the west wing flagstone wall is the greeting room or anna room, which is entered by the door here on the west wing of the porch. There are two greeting rooms or anna rooms which are to be welcoming and comfortable. The West Anna Room is to be updated, magazine, and newspapers. On the wall, shared with the kitchen, is a wall of revolutionary fame. I would like to see three to five frames with portraits of these revolutionaries. Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, Nat Turner, John Brown, and Harry Tubman.
Behind the ante room, you can enter the library with fur floors and bookshelves. Here we have a full wall of books, and off to the far left corner of this library is the entrance to my office. We encounter a pocket door that opens into the upstairs master bedroom with a full bar with a liquor closet. There's a king size bed, crystal furniture, African art, mahogany furniture, lots of large mirrors, mirror ceilings, and a three sided gas fireplace and soft blue light. It is important to note, with respect to anyone who may be justly sensitive to animal rights, that the basket on the bed is indeed fake for her <laughs> and is only there for decoration. <laughs> there is a door leading from the master bedroom to the master bathroom with a six foot by nine foot hot tub. <laughs> the cell I presently live in is but six foot by eight foot. From the master bedroom is a door that leads to our greenhouse. I have attempted many times to grow plants in my prison cell, but would only gain a stem, and the plant would soon die. I learned that concrete walls and steel bars stifle growth, which is another reason why it is so necessary this house be made of wood. The luscious rooftop garden can be full of tomatoes, green beans, peas, and other veggies, as well as annual flowers such as gloxenia, tulips, and roses. The greenhouse threatens the house with its added flow of created oxygen. It gives the house life and keeps it lumber from warping over a period of time. To the back of the master bedroom is a fireplace. On one of the three angle sides is a trap door that leads down to an escape route from this room through the chimney to an underground bunker. The underground bunk is 35 feet from the house. The bunk is really beneath the floor of the swimming pool. The bunk is made of strong cement and is attached to an artificial drainage. It is equipped with all military essentials. Bulletproof vest, generator, radio, full oxygen tank, computer video for outside viewing, canned food ration, flashlight, cases of bottled water, gas mask, and a large first aid kit. The bunk is designed for safety measures. If attacked, seriously under attack, the wood house can be set afire with more than enough time for you and your family to escape unharmed. Let's head back to the house. In the third bedroom, I prefer a room consisting of various different cultures with cabinetry crafted of old cypress and thick white carpet. There is a bank of three windows, which spans a room rear wall overlooking the side porch and lawn beyond. The house is to have two bathrooms, one with counter and mirror and a large bathtub. The other, on the first floor, blue tile and equipped with a shower and thick glass casing. The shower in Angola is shameful. It is a cage. There's a female who works the control panel at the front of the tier, and she watches you while you're in the shower. It is a continued attempt by the prison uh, to humiliate prisoners. I have had absolutely no privacy when taking a shower for over 30 years, so the thick glass casing is essential for securing privacy. The blue tile bathroom is the only bathroom downstairs. You can also assess it through the conference room. Speaking of, the three large windows in front of the conference room are symbolic of the Angola Three. Large, open, and with nothing to hide. They are also double pane and bulletproof. The stone walls you see here are non-structural, fake walls that were added after Jackie sent pictures from a recent trip to Portugal where she fell in love with the old stone architecture. It's the idea that counts, right? <laughs> the house is designed with two greeting room or inner room and two front doors to ensure openness and a sense of welcome. Coming up as a child, the only time I recall locking the doors 
was in the winter time or when everyone would leave the house. Other than that, the door stayed open. I guess I want to recapture that form of freedom. You're now standing over Jack and I can sit on a wraparound porch. It is made of the hard, pale wood of birch. Due to the extension of the wraparound porch, birch is more appropriate to prevent sagging and maintain a balance over the years of wear and tear. The wraparound porch was not constructed for the purpose of beauty, but rather to discourage stray animals from getting too close. Consequently, it provides a third layer of protection to the house as well as a place to socialize and enjoy lazy evenings with comrades. From the back of the wraparound porch, you can walk into the backyard. There is, as you can see, a huge oak tree, preferably oak to withstand strong hurricanes. Under the large oak tree will be my patio. To the left of the swimming pool, there's a guest house with two open rooms to accommodate out-of-state activists. There's an outdoor lamp post for security purposes. <laughs> the guest house mimics the simple A-frame of the master house. A-frame was chosen for its simplicity and Louisiana nostalgia. The guest house is equipped with a small day bay, competent portable laptop computers, telephones, and television sets. The rooms must be open with sliding glass doors to accommodate people who may suffer from claustrophobia. I would like for you to build me a swimming pool with a light green bottom and a large black panther in the center. This house project is going to be great. It's something new being exposed from the mind of a prisoner who spent more than 38 years in prison and 33 of those years in a cage 23 hours a day. I wonder how a psychologist would evaluate me as a person. The house that you and I are constructing is not just a house from some deep dark hole in my sight. It is a house I believe that is born out of the years of oppression I've endured, mixed with, and from a much younger and brighter generation. Everything about this house is built with protection from the past attacks. I prefer a house made of wood, not because of beauty, but to easily set a fire to and escape to the bunker in tone to safety in case of a serious attack. I suppose there are many other constructions of the house that are found from similar unexplained reasons, but its richness comes from all that energy you are adding as you build it alongside of me. To build this house is to build my soul, I'm often asked, what did I come to prison for? And now that I think about it, Jackie, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I came here for. What matters now is what I leave with. And I can show you, however I leave, I won't leave nothing behind. on this image which I took in Tobago. It's pretty rad, I think. And um, I've been talking for about a little over an hour. Um, and so I want to leave space if anybody needs to leave. It's totally cool. And just let you know that um, Herman's House has a website. And now, thanks to people a lot younger than myself, a Facebook group site or something like that. It's on Facebook, it's cool. It's in the 21st century. And if you'd like, you can keep in touch with the project that way. Um, or through the website, just send me an email. And there's always an open invitation to come to New Orleans, anytime. And I have a house there that I bought with some friends. And that house is made um, to be a space uh, where there is an intersection of art, ideas, and activism. And it belongs to the city of New Orleans, ultimately, and it belongs to that history and that culture and its open door, as long as you don't work for the FBI. 
<laughs> so, thank you very much for your attention and patience. Open it up to questions if you guys have some after one more hoot at. Yeah. Yay. Yeah. I know there's questions. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, well, I've been working on it since 2003, so in that, in that way it's been successful, and of course there's always lulls and highs and whatever else you ride on this, you know, crazy wave of working with inmates in Louisiana. But I think, um, I think it's been sustainable because, uh, I mean, part of it is respect for the fact that Herman's been in solitary confinement for 38 years, and he's sustained that, you know, he's triumphed that, and that's really humbling and inspiring at the same time, but as far as other people getting involved and remaining involved, you know, there's several, and I think not only are they inspired by um, Herman and Albert and Robert, but also um, by the sense of hope in this project, by the idea that you can be part of something that, that can actually happen and that can actually make a difference. You know, it's kind of the wave that Obama rode, um, was this idea of hope and change. And I feel like he saw my website before he ran for president, actually, <laughs> putting it out there. But um, that language is something that, you know, collectively, we need to hear. Like, sometimes it's really easy to forget that, and it's eclipsed by all of the tragedy and sadness and reality. And the truth is, people are awesome. and great things are happening in the world, really beautiful, beautiful, fearless things are happening. And we have to remember that. And we have to hold on to that and use that to, to fuel our own courage. Yeah. Someone had a question in the back. Yeah, and I, I, like I said, I've just sort of co-opted art to be my tool to talk about these things. But also not just to illustrate what's wrong with the world, but to illustrate what can be right. And I think they're equally important, you know. And that, that's taken years to learn and to understand. And I think part of the process of me still doing this is, um, is questioning it and questioning the value of art all the time. And then really challenging myself in a lot of ways, and having Herman challenge me. He's really challenging to work with. Like, I just went and visited Albert on Thanksgiving, and I left, and I was like, man, why didn't I do the house that Albert built? Like, <laughs> it would have been built already. <laughs> um, you know, so I think that's a big part of it is, is, um, is no matter what you do, you don't have to only be an artist, right? but always challenging the integrity and intention of what you're doing, the double eyes, you know? Snake eyes. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I think inside prison and outside prison, that's what you're talking about, inside and outside. Yeah, I mean, well, the, the visibility of how it's affected people on the outside is clear just through who or, 
or what has written articles or made films or whatever. And once again, that's super cool. Like for me, I'm just doing my thing. Whoever wants to take it and do it, do it. On the inside, it's a little bit harder to see. So it's through Herman and Albert's eyes that I hear about it. And also, like, if I go to visit Herman and another inmate is able to say, hey, I know you, you know, um, it's because of Herman's project. Um, for me, the most important thing is to get him out of prison. And so knowing that, that that's been achieved in some sense, and in some sense there's been freedom for Herman Wallace during this e e egregious life he's been forced into, then, then it's successful no matter what. I don't give a shit if it's in Prospect One or not, you know. It's cool. And um, and I know that like other prisoners have written me because they've read about it or they've read the book or whatever, and that's always a big compliment. Yeah. Go ahead, Josan. What about Albert? What about Albert? Yeah, he's the guy we don't talk about. We do talk about it's Albert. Like we don't. We didn't hear about him. Mm -hmm. I mean, so. I mean, I feel like. Um, when you talk about Herman, you talk about Albert and King. They're known as the Angola Three. And any time I present this project, it's called The House That Herman Built. I always mention Albert, you know. And any time you look at the website or the exhibition, it's always for Herman, Albert, and Robert. The reason that I started this was her with Herman was because while I was writing them simultaneously, Herman went into the dungeon. And he needed it more. And I also liked the mnemonic. I'm just kidding. It was because he was suffering a lot more. And um, and Albert is so appreciative of it and so gracious, you know, and has said many times that this has been the most effective tool that's organized on his behalf as well, you know. And, yeah, I mean, I, at the end of the lecture, ask you to write Herman and Albert, you know. They're gr great, great, great human doings. Really great. Yeah? I thought, oh wait, sorry, do you, can she just raise her hand a little bit faster than you? <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just wondering if the, I mean, if they mentioned the photos in the, in the uh, question of the pages that you show, um, that if the house gets built, but I mean, you see these pictures, but if the house were to be built, what is it, where, where would it be, and what would it be? So, I mean, Herman's a Black Panther, and so a lot of the principles of the 10-point platform have gone into the physical and emotional constructs and conceptual constructs of this house. And so the house will function as a community center, and not dissimilar to the house I live in now, which is greatly influenced by my relationship to Herman, Albert, and Robert. And while he's in prison, in prison you know, he recognizes by all of the young people that he's now on the tier with that there's a great need to have a space, an alternative space for young people to go in as a preventative me measure. You know, one of the things I didn't really talk about was, you know, the United States right now has over 2.3 million people incarcerated, and that's more per capita than any other country in the world, and it's the greatest amount of people incarcerated in the history of the world, which is crazy, right? And, um, the state that has the most people in prison is the state of Louisiana, and the city that has the most people incarcerated is the city of New Orleans. So it's all relative, and so having a house that's designed by someone who suffered at the hands of an institution or of a system that institutionalizes racism is really significant, you know, and his target is to stop this, to put an end to it. Yeah. A few, yeah. The response is never, and support is never as big as outside of the United States. No surprise, you know. I just said something else. I do do some support work as well with the prisoners, and I've been talking to a couple of prisoners, like in the last couple of days, only oh, seeing this thing and everything, and telling them about the website and everything like that. And like one guy, he he got a life twenty five or life twenty which means he's eligible, whether he gets it or not is one thing, but for parole at 20 years. But um, he's been in 17 and a half years. He spent two years in solitary in the very beginning, locked up. He, he just kind of like broke down. And for him, who is 36 years old, <laughs> to think that his whole life being spent in that was just like, he went like, how, how, how is he doing this? You know, so I'm just not 
I'm just speaking with other prisoners and other ones that have spent some of them a few different times, a few years. Uh, one guy I know has spent 30 years, probably about five years in total. But we just don't see these enormous numbers like you have down in the States with people in the solitary confinement like that. Yeah, well, I hope it remains that way. And, you know, you guys need to be vigilant <laughs> as citizens because there's great shifts in the world all over. And if we can sell you our, like, TV and, like, all of our pop culture and all that stuff, we can sell you our ideas for a prison industrial complex. P.S. It's really profitable. You know, in the United States was founded by a bunch of white slave owners who wrote this so-called constitution to protect their own interests. And it was founded and became a superpower really fast because of slavery. So it makes a lot of sense that we maintain these paradigms of slavery so that we can maintain our economic status. And, you know, it's in, and it's a capitalist world, and so there are these competitions ongoing, and it's not impossible to happen in other places. For instance, England is now privatizing prisons in the UK. It's disgusting, and so we have to remain vigilant and, and be responsible to stop it. Did you have a question? Well, I was a, I had a number of things. I was going to uh, try to ask, why, why do you think in the United States you don't get the same feedback? But originally, I think my, uh, I think you've demonstrated, I mean, and I, I assume you think that there's a strong power of uh, therapeutic power in art. And you mentioned earlier about how you sort of used to assume that the people in prison were bad people. And, and now that it's, you know, we recently in Canada, we've been talking about um, making criminal acts um, and penalizing them in more of the harsher ways. Uh, and even though you know most psychologists and most people in the field you know talk about how that is actually inefficient. Mm -hmm. And um, so now that you know more about the prison system, what do you what do you think uh, art can do, or what kind of what kind of solutions do you see to crime um, other than just Well, I mean, <clears throat> the monster that ultimately we're fighting is, is um, it, it's the monster that puts uh, profit before the effectiveness of, of how a country treats its citizens, right? And until we change that, there's, there's not going to be any rehabilitation or whatever because it, they want more, prison, more prisoners. Louisiana is the harshest sentencing state in the country. And um, obviously for me, there's social welfare programs that are preventative, that are really effective. One of them is teaching kids how to read. New Orleans, 30% of the population can't read beyond the fifth grade level in 2010. 60% of the prison population in the United States suffers from the same disease, right? And it's structured that way in the United States. It sounds conspiratorial, but we are supposedly the richest country in the world, or I don't know, maybe Ikea is or something now. <laughs> but for some reason, we can't properly educate our citizens, and it's disgusting. And I think that it's constructed that way that we can maintain you know, a certain level of, of labor, free labor. And um, that has to change. That has to be completely deconstructed in order to rebuild it in such a way that we prevent people from, from serving time. And also redefine what it means to serve time. But until that idea is manifested globally, it's not going to change. You know? Did I answer your question? It was a big question. <laughs> Are there any more? Is everyone really hungry? There's one more. Um, I, Jackie, I came across your website and your project a couple of years ago when I was doing some research um, for this project that I'm working on. And it's, um, I don't really have a question. I just really wanted to thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, and also the, the Elm Gallery for bringing you this. Um, the project I'm working on is with uh, my brother who's incarcerated in Texas and um, we are working on a film together and it's, when I came across your project it was the first time I saw something that was sort of similar but used to 
joy to somehow move through the sadness and the, the sense of paralysis and to say something maybe bigger. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm like so into what you're doing. <laughs> I'm so happy. And if I had $500,000, uh -huh. I wish I could be with you right now. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, thank you. I'd love to talk to you afterwards about the project yeah. with your brother. No, but like I said, I don't do this alone. And I, I do it because I'm inspired by all the other things that people are doing in the world. And, and because I have this privilege, and, and it's my responsibility, for sure. You know, the privilege of understanding where Herman, Albert, and Robert are coming from. It's a privilege of going to Stanford on a full ride, you know. And this privilege of living in New Orleans right now. And it's, 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 it's uh, challenging, but of course it's, it's what moves me, you know. It's cool. It's real cool. I'm lucky. Yeah. Did you have a question or just an itch on your nose? Okay. Anyway, what's your main Yeah, well, first of all, I'd, I had been organizing on behalf of his release beforehand uh, for about a year. I actually ran a marathon registered as Herman N. Albert. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, you know, his, when I, uh, the first letter, just to give you context, the first letter I wrote them, I was like, I don't know what to say. So I taped, um, I duct taped a disposable camera to my wrist and I set my watch to go off every hour. And I just took a photo, whatever whatever was in front of me, or if I was sleeping, whatever was beside me. And I sent them, Herman and Albert, each 24 photos uh, that most people would look at and just throw away. You know, they were blurry, or it was like my ugly feet, or um, bedspread, or whatever it was. It was just whatever was in front of me, the dashboard of my vehicle. And I sent them each those photographs and said, here's 24 hours in my life. I can't imagine what yours is like. And that's how we initiated the conversation. In fact, I wrote, Dear Mr. Woodfox and Dear Mr. Wallace. And they were both like, please call me Herman or please call me Alvin. And then I think I talked a little bit about it in the beginning. When I did ask him about his dream house, he said he didn't really dream of a house, you know, and that he dreamt of being a revolutionary in the fields of Mexico. And then that changed, you know, I think because he had to become aware that of his, uh, where he is physically, you know, and then he said, all right, I'll do it. And I think in a lot in the beginning, he was just doing it as a, a, a graciousness towards me, you know, and my efforts. And then I could actually see him shift and go inside the house and take it really seriously. You know, like in the pantry, when uh, I just send him stills of all of the, the photos because he doesn't have access to video. But um, in the pantry when he saw it, when I first made it, and it took me forever. Like my skill set on the, the CAD video was super low, and so I just kind of jerry-rigged it the way I knew how. Like I just gave it my all. And you know, it's like loads and loads of hours and meticulous work. And I sent him the still image, and he was like, where's the Tabasco and the onions and <laughs> the bottles of wine? And I was like, oh God, but he's really in it, you know? He's really in the house when he gets that detailed. And the same thing in the kitchen. The last thing he said was, where's the sprinklers? Because if you're going to be cooking in there, we need some sprinklers, you know? You make him live that, actually. You put him there, or there in the house. Yeah, he puts himself there. I just gave him a, a, some tools. Those are my tools, you know? Bridge. Yeah, a little bridge, exactly. It's cool. Thank you. And any more? I'll stay after for a little while. Sometimes it's hard to ask questions in the public space. No one wants to ask me if I'm in love with Herman or if he's in love with me. <laughs> That's because it's not an American audience. The answer is no. <laughs> I love him. You know, I love him. I love him. 
and he loves me, but it's it's family. It's he calls me his cater cousin. So, same with Woodfox. I love him. I love him so much. I'm really, really, really blessed in the greatest sense of the word, because three of my best friends are Black Panthers. <laughs> it's cool. So thank you very much, and thanks so much for bringing me. Yeah,